Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In this episode, I bring you a guest who brings up EOS, which stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. But what is EOS? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? I already stated what EOS stands for, Entrepreneurial Operating System, so I'm going to refer to it as EOS moving forward. First, what is EOS? EOS is a complete set of simple concepts and practical tools that has helped thousands of entrepreneurs around the world get to where they want their businesses. EOS was developed by Gino Wickman, who is an author, speaker, teacher, and entrepreneur. Gino has actually written several books about EOS that you can find online and in various bookstores, I am sure, but I'm not here to sell anyone on a book. So what does EOS do? EOS is not an operating system. It is a people operating system. According to EOS, implementing EOS will help the entrepreneur and entrepreneur's leadership team get better at three things. Vision. Everyone in the organization is 100% on the same page with where the entrepreneur is going and how the entrepreneur plans to get there. Traction. Instill focus, discipline, and accountability throughout the company so that everyone executes on that vision every day. Healthy. Help the entrepreneur leaders become more cohesive, functional, healthy leadership team. How is it done and why is it important? EOS works on taking work stuff and compartmentalizing it into short and long-term categories. This ensures that the employees know what needs to get done, when it needs to get done, and how much of a priority it is to get done. The goal is to create a more effective team that executes better. EOS breaks down their categories into four buckets. One year, goals that need to be done in the calendar year with three to seven goals per year. Less is more. 90 days. Rocks are the three to seven most important things you must get done in the next 90 days, with employees having one of three rocks per quarter and the leadership team typically having three to seven rocks per quarter. Seven days. Two dues or any action item a team member commits to that must be completed within the next seven days. Capture these on a team's to-do list. Issues. Issues is the unresolved problems, ideas, and opportunities. These are items that need to be discussed and resolved. Issues have two sub-compartments. Long-term, issues that cannot be resolved this quarter, so 90 days. And short-term, issues that must get resolved this quarter within 90 days. That is just one resource that comes with EOS. Their team helps to find 10-year targets, 3-year pictures, and 1-year plan. They can help create SMART goals, which stands for Specific, Measurable, Obtainable, Realistic, and Timely. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. EOS is another tool to help entrepreneurs thrive, not only in business, but in leadership as well. There are many free tools and ebooks online that the entrepreneur has available to them right now, and here is one of them. This program is built for the busy entrepreneur. It is designed to solve issues and track how the issues were solved and by who. It helps bring focus and accountability. It helps get to the right people in the right seat. Now, I must admit, EOS is complex with accountability charts, smart goals, weekly meetings, etc., but it is useful. However, everyone must be on board in order for it to succeed. Wickman discusses inviting openness and honesty from staff in his book, Traction. And in truth, this process will not happen overnight. Wickman also mentions this in his book, Traction, specifically highlights companies moving at their own pace and forcing it to move any faster could be damaging. For larger companies over 100 employees, adopting the EOS system may take longer than a smaller, more nimble startup with less than 100 staff members. According to Louisville Geek, Completely adopting EOS could take up to three years within larger companies. The system is not going to be perfect. And I stated my goal is not to push the system onto anyone. My goal is to simply provide awareness that EOS is out there and available to entrepreneurs who may find it valuable to them. After all, we are a globe of entrepreneurs. And when small businesses win, we all win. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next 
Max Entrepreneur focuses on high quality work at a fair price. He is a husband, father, camper, hiker, ultra marathon, and Ironman. He is a private pilot and certified home inspector. Please welcome the founder and CEO of Cora Home, Daniel Phelps. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Daniel Felt, the owner of Cora, Cora Hair, Cora Home. Man, see, I said I wasn't going to do any edits, and now I'm going to have to do the first edit. Daniel, how are we doing? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm stoked because we're going to talk about something I think a lot of people are going to need to be hearing, especially as we get into the wintertime. And we're talking about homes and how to manage and take care of our homes. But first, let's introduce the world to Daniel Felt. Give him a little background. Who is Daniel? Yeah, uh, for me, I grew up on a small farm in central Minnesota. Today I live, uh, I don't know if it's quite a suburb, but on the west side of Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, I live there with my, my wife, my son. Uh, we got one more on the way. We don't know if it's a boy or girl yet. And we've got a bunch of chickens, a couple horses, a couple dogs, but I drive into the Metro each day to run, uh, Cura home. Um, grew up in a large family, but, uh, today run, run Cura home. And we love, love growing that and growing a family. It's full-time, full-time job. I love it. So now are you going to wait for the kid to, to be born to determine or kind of figure out the sex? Yeah, we waited the first one and it was really fun in a day and age where so many things are predictable and things like that. It's very fun to be able to yell, it's a boy or yep. it's a girl at the hospital. So we really enjoyed that for the first one. You know, it's kind of funny. My wife and I did the same thing. We waited for the first one and we're waiting for the second one. We're doing February. We we're talking about this earlier. We're going to wait. That's like the, yeah. that's like the last cool surprise you get, right? Like, oh man, exactly. <laughs> here it is. Now, now talk about Cura Homes. What is it? What do you guys do? Yeah, we offer primarily two services. The first one is uh, not very sexy. It's air duct cleaning. That's about 50% of our business. Most people know what that is. I think we're the best at it, but you know, we offer air duct cleaning. <laughs> the other 50% of our business, which I think is um, a lot more fun and exciting and was the primary vision for the company is a home maintenance subscription. So we visit your home once every quarter. We have a few clients that have um, higher needs at their home and we visit monthly. And a lot of people are also biannual, but the majority are quarterly visits. And we offer 32 different maintenance services that every perfect homeowner should be doing. But we all know that life and family and work get in the way. And so um, everything from cleaning your dryer vent, AC unit, refrigerator coils, we even change smoke alarm batteries and we'll change the direction on your fan in the spring and the fall. All these little things that we all know should be done, but just happen to neglect. Hold on. You change the directions of fans? Why? Why? Yes. <laughs> why? I, I've never, I own a home. I, this is all new. Why should I yeah. be changing the direction of my fan? Yeah. So depending on where you live and things like that, but you know, here in Minnesota and anywhere where we have a uh, warm climates and then cold climates, we want that cool air and warm air to be pushed around in the right direction. So at certain times we want to be pulling cooler air up. So basically you're just trying to make it so that your home is as comfortable as possible and efficient as possible. And we're always looking at like the really small numbers that turn into big things like cleaning refrigerator coils, for example, can save up to $11 per month. Okay. Well, not that big of a deal, but over the long term, and maybe yeah. you have two refrigerators, like one in your garage for, you know, the, uh, for your refreshments and, and another one in the house, all these things. And it, it adds up to, wow, we saved a couple hundred bucks this year by properly maintaining our home. So that's just like one small thing that just helps your home be more efficient. And I think the main thing that it does is it helps you be more comfortable in the room, but it also does help with the efficiency. Interesting. Now, where did this idea come from? How did you start this business? Yeah, I um, was working actually for my brother's company. He owns a window cleaning and holiday light business, and he had bought into a home management company. And so they were, they were working for like the 1% of the 1%. I'm talking like Vikings players, for, you know, NBA, NFL players. And um, a big frustration was we don't have enough people enough clients. They had like two clients at the time, pretty early on. And I said, why don't you offer something that every single homeowner needs, but um, not as expensive? You know, they were they, like, they would do things like we will schedule everything. We'll take care of everything for you. You can basically show up to your summer home or your winter home, whatever, and everything's taken care of. And I said, let's just do these things that every single house needs. And you don't have to be the top 1% to afford it. And uh, that just wasn't in their business model at the time. They said it wouldn't work. And so 
I um, am a very stubborn person and <laughs> I thought it would work. And so I did a lot of research. I additionally was very fortunate that I helped my parents build their dream home when I was 16 and 17 years old. I um, got to, to skip school to pour concrete. I got to skip school to put shingles on and everything in between, right? So um, a lot of lessons were involved there, nights and weekends building that house. And so I, I had a good idea, but I became a certified home inspector online course to know what was going on in houses. And uh, I decided that if there's ever a time to do it, it was then. I was 26. I was single. I was house hacking. I was renting out the base of my house and I was living in the top half. And I also was um, training and, and boarding dogs in my backyard. And so oh, between wow. all that stuff, I had a pretty consistent, I was making about 40 to 45K a year doing that. And so I was like, I can, I can afford to take this risk. I took a home equity line out against my house that I could use. Then that was $32,000. And uh, that was enough for me to take a leap of faith and try it out. So you financed this using the HELOC. Yep. Yeah. I, and I, cause I thought like right off the bat, like I'd put a website out or, you know, open a Facebook account and you, you tell a few people and all of a sudden the phone's going to ring. And uh, that's not the way it works. You uh, people, <laughs> there's, there's actually about, um, about 10 to 20 people a month, Google routine home maintenance in Minneapolis. And so we are not showing up at all. This is a completely like a relationship business. You, people need to hear about it one way or another. Um, but the air duct cleaning is very different. There's thousands and thousands of searches for that. And so that's why we ended up adding um, air duct cleaning along the way because people are asking for it. And then additionally, we can pull on new clients that are actually out there searching for it. Interesting. So I, I mentioned I own a home. What are some mm -hmm. of the most typical things that people overlook? In fact, one of the things you already mentioned was the refrigerator. Didn't yep. even think about that. You know, what are some yeah. other things that we forget? Some of the main ones, refrigerator coils are for sure big one. Uh, dryer vents, you know, you just don't ever think about it. So cleaning your dryer vent on an annual basis. We service about 700 homes on a quarterly basis. And almost every single one of them selects that dryer vent. They know it's important. We find a lot of AC units that have a, a sweater on them full of cotton wood and dust and debris. So cleaning that AC unit helps with the efficiency. Uh, in Minnesota and a lot of other climates, we have air exchangers. Some people call them an HRV or an ERV. That is, houses are so efficient, efficient now that there needs to be a box in your utility room. It's hanging up. If you don't know what I'm talking about. And uh, there's three filters in there and that needs to be cleaned out as well. Those are probably four of the most neglected things. On top of that, um, things are just being built with a lot more filters now. So people don't realize like the dishwasher, if you buy a new one, one of my favorite things to do is go through like a Home Depot or Lowe's and open up every single dishwasher and every single one has a filter now. So yeah. um, if you're buying new appliances, they most likely have a filter that need to be um, clean. And a lot of people just don't, do not realize that. And they break down and, and, a, a, you know, you get a $150, $200 house call from a, from a, a repair person. And the, it was a simplistic, it's not running efficiently because the filters are not clean. Interesting. So, you know, you mentioned um, that you kind of, when you're 16 and 17, you're working with your parents' house, building it, helping build out. And then you went and got your um, license for uh, being a, what was it? I can't recall. Yeah, I became a certified home inspector. Home and inspector. I, I don't think that that is required to okay. run this business, especially now, because we're actually now selling franchises. And I'm going to teach you everything you need to know. But for me to have confidence to professionally offer a service, because we walk into homes that are like a townhome that are really simplistic when it comes to maintenance, and we have like $12 million estates. And so the maintenance needs on those two different properties are completely different. And by becoming a certified home inspector, that really gave me the, the knowledge to say, here's the differences and here's what needs to be maintained. That way, when I walk into a utility room with Susie homeowner and I'm explaining everything we can do, I don't have to be uh, Googling something or asking Siri what's going on in this house. I know what's, what's going on. So um, other, you know, besides that, like licenses that you need are mostly the same license that you would need to run any business, you know, the, the LLC and, and the insurance and that. There are some states that do require certain um, licenses, like a HVAC license to clean air ducts. But in Minnesota and Denver, where we're currently operating, that we don't need those additional licenses. So you mentioned that you're now um, leveraging a franchise model. Can you, one, explain what the franchise model is for listeners? And then two, explain how you decided to kind of go that route. Yeah. So what a franchise is, is that you are, um, you, you see a brand that you like or that you're interested in or model, and you're contacting uh, me as the franchisor and saying, I like what you're doing. I want to run the exact same thing in my location. So I want to run my own business, but I want to run it exactly like yours. And so we create a franchise disclosure document. Most people call it an FDD. 
And that is saying a set of rules that you agree to follow. So like our code of ethics and things like that, uh, how we service homes. So we're giving you an answer sheet of about a 600 page manual, unlimited training. And we're, and we're saying, Hey, here's what works for us really well here. And now you can run it in your location. So you own the business, but you do pay a royalty. The most common royalty is about 7%. And that's what we charge as well. So you buy in for service industry. Most of the time it's right around 45 to 65,000. We're at that $45,000 mark to, to buy in. And that's giving you basically the secret sauce to run a, a business. So there's a lot of, um, if you're not familiar with franchises, a lot of, you probably frequently support a ton of franchises in your area from McDonald's to Subway to the gym you go to. Um, a lot of franchises are out there. It's a very common model for um, to grow and scale a business. Uh, your second question, why we decided to go that way, um, that route, we were running um, locations in a few different areas. And what we had found is that when people are not 100% bought into your idea, uh, it's really easy on a Friday afternoon to go to the beach rather than continue pushing through the day. And so we, we tried a lot of different things, talked to, you know, I have a business coach, tried a lot of different unique things, but a lot, while we were having those challenges of motivating and encouraging people in different territories to build a business, we are also having people from territories that we probably wouldn't start a corporate owned location contacting us to buy a franchise and we weren't, we weren't there yet. So between the, the demand for it and then our pain points, we decided to switch our growth model to continuing to organic, organically grow in Denver and Minneapolis, and then allow those to grow in other territories across this, the country. So you, so how did you then kind of go to the marketing piece? Let's talk about marketing because you're, you went from, you know, individual owner to now franchising. How do one, you franchise your company and then two, how do you, or I'm sorry, one, how do you market your company? And then two, how do you market to franchise it? Like, how do you, how do you engage other owners to say, Hey, this, this is a franchise models available. Yeah, we're doing a lot of things to, to market. One is we're getting out there telling our story. Uh, exactly what I'm doing right now yep. with, with you. Uh, we are, you hire brokers, a lot of times they're commission only. And so it's, you can hire a lot of brokers. We're spending a little bit of money to be in your kind of buy into the good old boys club, right? So you're part of the club and now you're, you know, you're part of the Fran serve in order to sell, you know, franchises with them. Additionally, there's a lot of websites that are like kind of similar to if you wanted to buy like a bike, for example, you go to Craigslist. There's a lot of websites that if you want to buy a franchise, now you're listed on there and you can um, go that route. So we're, we're going through a lot of, we're trying to do it organically as possible and, and very, we're trying to be really frugal and beating to make sure that this thing 100% works. That being said, the very first newsletter we sent out in November of 2021, uh, a, a, a lady who's one of our customers sent it to her brother-in-law in Florida and he's super interested and should be signing the FDD very shortly wow. to, to sell our franchise. But it's a very long sales process because a lot of these people, they're not like coming out of high school saying like, oh, I'm going to buy a franchise. They're, they're usually in their late 20s. They've, they've worked a few places and they, they've decided they want to be their own boss in a proven model. Or they're in their 40s and 50s and there's, they're realizing that they want to build an asset so that they're set up for retirement. And so what's something that I can build and scale and then, then sell? When you're buying a franchise, you're, you own a company and you're just running it as that franchise. So it is a sellable asset. Um, so that's what we're, we're working on to get franchises sold. It's, uh, I think it's working, but, uh, a lot of people tell, tell me that your close rate for selling a franchise is 1%. So you need a hundred leads coming, hundred qualified leads coming in to sell one. And that's very different than air duct cleaning, which is like a 43% close rate for us or routine maintenance is like 90% close rate. So, uh, we're, we're, uh, our patience is being tested and, uh, we're, but we're riding that wave and we're learning a lot. Nice. And in fact, you know what? We'll, we'll talk offline, got an idea about that model and, and a subscription kind of process with it. We'll, we'll chat offline a little bit. I think, I think, I think you're onto something here because I think a lot of the millennials right now, I mean, we're buying houses now and we're also like things that are really easy and, and at their, our fingertips. And so having the knowledge of what we needed to do right then and there and having like ready to go, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. <laughs> great. So now you, you're talking about like, you, now, how do you, um, you know, you've, so you started your brand, you're starting to build it. What has been some of the hardest things either about starting the business or starting the franchise? What are some of the hardest things that you've had to run into? Yeah, I think it's, it's getting cash flow going quickly is very difficult. You start your business and I, it seems like a lot of businesses are not profitable for 18 to 24 months. That, that seems to be the norm now that I'm, you know, really networked with, with a ton of business owners and you get down and you get, you get into the, 
the down and dirty. And they're like, oh yeah, I didn't make money for three years. And, and then, but then people always think, well, I'm different. I'm going to do it better than, than Joe. And uh, you're, you're not different. It's going to take some time. So it was really challenging just making sure that cash flow was going there. And I've always been very interested in a very fast growth model. We started in 2016 and we're now servicing 700 routine maintenance clients. We barely had any in the beginning. So you got to, you got to kind of catch up and growth does suck cash out of a business. And there's, I don't know, there's, there's no way around that. I also wanted to maintain 100% ownership. I didn't want to sell off portions to private equity or things like that. And so it does suck a lot of cash. So as a business owner, if you're looking into starting your own company, I think it's, it's great to, to do that, but no, like you got to save up a little bit of money so that you can live off of, because it, it seems really great. You think a lot of cash is going to flow in, but it, it really goes back into the business quite quickly. Yeah. Let's, let's explain what are some of those like hidden costs, those hidden expenses that individuals might not know as a small business owner coming into it is being, you know, wanting to become an entrepreneur, own their own business. What are some of those hidden costs that kind of caught you off guard? Yeah, I, I'm, I was surprised at the amount that like it costs to employ someone, uh, you know, for example, the, you have to pay a payroll company because you're probably going to screw it up and then get like audited. And that takes a lot of time out of you. Workman's comp, you know, we pay 3.9% of every dollar that we pay someone. We're paying 3.9 uh, cents on that in order to make sure that you're taken care of in case you're injured. Just the employee taxes on top of that, social security, things like that, that you're like, well, it's, it can't be that bad. And, and it adds up. It's 11, 12%. And when your payroll gets to the point where it's, you know, 10, 15, $20,000 a week, these percentage points can really suck out on the bottom line. Uh, additionally, I think the, uh, it takes on different models or different services. It's, I'm always surprised at how long it takes to get, get it profitable. For example, you get a new routine maintenance client and you service them one time. And, and what you think is that sweet, I just made $350 but you didn't because you had to go out and do an estimate and then came back and then you sent out technicians to do it. And you actually didn't even make money the first visit. You lost money. You had to lose money to get that customer. The second visit you're breaking even. And the third one, you're actually finally making money six months after you got that client. And I think that's why we are one of the very few routine maintenance clients in the entire country, routine maintenance companies in the entire country that have scaled to the size that we are because we also had air duct cleaning. If I clean your air ducts today, you pay today, we're done. And, and we made a profit margin on that job. Okay. So I think the biggest thing for, for people is that, um, you know, it's, it's very hard to grow and scale a company. You have to trust people. And there's all these little things like also you have to pay $60 for QuickBooks and this and that. And there's all these little things that you might think like, well, if I go on do a job and I charge $50 an hour, I'm making 45 of that. Cause I just had to pay for my gas. And that's not the case. You're maybe going to make like 15 or $20 of that after expenses. So making sure that you're charging enough to support growth. And sometimes you have to refund a customer. If you make a mistake, we try to be perfect, but we're not. And uh, there's little things that you have to do. You've got to have some extra cash on hand and, and build the margins in from the very beginning. You know, you highlighted a few hidden costs that I don't think really individuals understand. One time your own personal time, right? So you're an individual and you're driving out to a location, that's, you know, count those hours as hourly time because those you should be paying yourself for your work, right? Um, so those, you think about that, your gas, right? Your traveling expenses, but then also your insurance, your car maintenance. You know, these are little things that we forget to think about that really kind of all goes in. And I'm kind of reaching back to my real estate days and thinking about all those times I was going and showing houses to prospective buyers, and you go, you, you will show one of your buyers, you know, 10 to 12 houses before they put an offer at one. There's no guarantee they're going to get that one. So you might have to go back and show another 10 to 15 for another offer. That's a lot of driving. And then when you kind of yeah. put that into consideration, you put the gas into consideration, you're like, oh, wait, after this commission, I'm, I'm getting close to breaking even. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's even. Yeah. Now, what would you say has been easy about this process? Uh Boy, <laughs> that's yeah. Has there been anything uh, easy? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I think what's been what's easier than than I anticipated was I thought that like managing employees was gonna be really really difficult. But if you if you do enough to equip them to be successful, I believe that a lot of people do buy into the the ethics and the morals and the principles of what your company is doing. And if they believe in you, they will really go way above and beyond. You don't have to ask people like. Hey, can you stay an extra half hour to get this done? Like they just, they do it because they believe in what you're doing. And so sharing your goals and your missions with the people around you, you really become a team. 
And I'm always impressed at the sacrifices that the people on our team are willing to make without even being asked to really go above and beyond. So we we really focus a lot on training people in. We have a 600 page manual that tells you everything about how to run this company. And when you use those things and you and you give people a lot of information in the beginning, you want to hold it close because you think you're the only one that can do it as an entrepreneur but you've got to give that information out and that information equips your team to be successful. And it, it gets easier and easier and easier for your company to run without you. And that's ultimately should be the goal. I believe of every entrepreneur is get your company running without you. It, it creates a higher value. If you ever decide to sell one day and you met, you might be lucky and, and, and have a head of hair by the time you're done. And you're not <laughs> on break. So that's uh, always been really thankful for that. You know, I think what you just defined is the difference between an owner and a leader right? You're, you're building individuals to succeed even if they go somewhere else, right? Because if you build them up and, and I think that's what you kind of alluded to with the franchise model, you know, having these owners fill the, you know, the franchise owners fill that ownership of their small business and they can really been engage their, their employees. So that's really unique. Now you, you're talking about motivating your staff, right? You're talking about your 600 page. What motivates you? Yeah. You know, for me, I think a business is, it's all a game. And growing up, I loved Monopoly. Like, I love that freaking game. And I love, I love everything about it. And I still love it. Most people won't play with me because I get so <laughs> intense about it. And, and there's like hidden rules. If you don't know this, there is a rule in Monopoly that if you can't get enough houses on your property, you can't get a hotel. And, and uh, people have learned that and people that I've played with to keep me from getting hotels, they, they only keep houses on their properties and they don't upgrade to a hotel. And then there's not enough houses and, and it's very frustrating and you can't, and the game goes on for hours and hours and hours. So there's hidden rules in that game that people play. But I think what really motivates me, there's a lot of things. I love following like an EOS process where you're working on, you know, every 90 days you're sitting down off site, setting your goals. And what are those five, three and one of your goals? But I, I like to think of it like as a Christmas card and, and we don't send out like a fancy Christmas card and write all this stuff. But I think of it at, if I did, what are you writing down this year that people are gonna be like, wow, did you see what the felt family did? Like they did this. And, and maybe for you, you lost five pounds. I don't know, but you got to have something written down on there. That's really impressive because all of a sudden one year turns into five, turns into 10, your kids are graduated and you're in a nursing home and life just flies by. So making sure that you're, you're setting goals and don't just set a goal on January 1st and forget it by the 5th, like everyone else, like keep on focusing so that, Hey, when we write the Christmas card at the end of the year, what are we going to say? And when you see great aunt Susie and she asks, how, Hey, how's everything going for you guys? You can say, great. I'm working on this, this, and this, and it, and it can be bigger or small. But for me, I really want to have something impressive that when I sit down at the end of the year and I'm having Christmas dinner with my family and we're talking about what we're thankful for, I can say, I'm, I'm thankful for, for this, this, and this. So I think it's all a game. I don't really care about how much money I make it. I, we have enough food on our table. Uh, we live in a really comfortable home and every, everything's happy. My wife and I are not motivated by how much we make, but we are very motivated by how much we can give. And I think using your God-given talents to build something while you're on the short time on earth is really important. And, and you're never going to stay back. So don't take that nap, go get a cup of coffee and you got to keep pushing because today is, it's the only time, time is you're not going to get it back. So you got to keep grinding. You got to keep pushing and, and you've got to move forward. Yeah. You know, that's very true. You know, one of the things I always talk about, you know, money for me, uh, my, my parents kind of, you know, they're one, one of four. So we didn't have a lot of money growing up. But one of the things I've always talked about was I, I want to have enough money to say no, but not, a, mm -hmm. but I don't want to have money that I have to say no, you know? So I want to yeah. be able to, if my kid wants something, I want to be able to say no, because you know what, you have to work for it first. And I don't want to have mm -hmm. to say no, because I just don't have the funds for it. Now, one of the things you mentioned EOS process, can you elaborate? What is, what is the acronym and can you elaborate on your process? Yeah. EOS, uh, it's a, uh, what is it? Something operating system. I forget what it is. There's a book called traction that talks about all of EOS and I'm, I'm, I'm spacing what it is at the moment, but what that principle is, is that essentially through studies that um, the average human works really, really well in 90 day cycles. That's the right amount of time to sit down and say, we're going to accomplish this. And so what we do and we have a business coach who is also an implementer for us, essentially. And every 90 days at the end of each quarter, we sit down and we look at where do we want Cure Home to be in five, three, and one year. 
And what does that look like for us? And, and maybe it's growing 1%, maybe it's we're quadrupling, but whatever it is, we set those goals down to this is what we're working towards. And then we say in the next 90 days, what do we have to do to achieve those goals? And then we break it down even to weekly. And so once a week, we're sitting down and we're chipping away at here's what we need to be doing this week so that in five years, we've done everything that we need to do. And we have we do have a coach that implements that for us. But the book Traction really does an awesome job of laying that out for uh, for you to understand what that is. And, and it really helps. It, it's been a game changer for us because it's so easy to all of a sudden, you know, back to the Christmas card list, all of a sudden the year has gone by. I'm like, shoot, we didn't get that done that we said we were going to do last January. And it's like, well, of course not. That was 12 months away. You know, that's you're, you're definitely not going to. So the 90 day thing is just enough. And I even find in my own personal, even though I feel I'm very motivated at the, when you're on day, like 80, 85, you're kind of like, I need a recharge. And then you go off site, you have a lunch with your team and all this stuff. And you're like, all right, guys, here's what, what here's what, what, here's what went well. And here's what we're going to do next time. And it gets everyone fired up again and you kind of recharge and reset for the 90 days. Nice. And so just for the folks at home, EOS stands for entrepreneurial operating system, which I will highlight. I think I'm going to talk about that before this episode because I think that's great. In fact, I actually wrote down the book Traction. Is that something I'll probably grab and read? Now, what keeps you, as a business owner, what keeps you up at night? You know, there's been a few things. Um, I think uh, making sure that your team, when you know someone has their absolute best to give and they and they don't give it, that's been a very frustrating thing. How you How do you motivate? How do you get the best out of people when you know they can do it right. Other than that, man, you get screwed over by vendors. You get you have written things down, and it's like you give people a budget. Like, hey, let's spend ten thousand dollars on marketing next month, and you get the bill, and it's fifteen thousand dollars. You're like, hey, what, what, where, where do things go wrong here? Like, here's the written email of here's our budget for the month. And like, oh, yeah, sorry, like that, this went wrong, but you still need to pay the bill. And like, just frustrating things like that that really you know, those, those having trusted relationships around you, working with people that you know, like, and trust is just so important. I don't think people hire to your home because, you know, yeah, sure. They need routine maintenance or they need air duct cleaning, but I believe people hire us because they see us online. They see everything we're doing. And I, I do believe that they know, like, and trust us as they're working with us. And I think that's extremely important. So yeah, there's little things that frustrate you, but I'm so fortunate because my wife does an awesome job of taking care of our house. And so I come home and I never miss dinner with my family. That's my rule. I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to miss that because that, that's just extremely important to me. And I come home to a happy laughing child and my wife is happy most of the time. And, <laughs> and that's really um, what, uh, that, that really helps me fall asleep most nights. I love it. And you know, for the folks listening at home, uh, it's a great kind of goal to have. Don't miss dinner with the family. I try to sit down with the family every night. I love it. My wife is an awesome cook. I'm a great barbecuer and I'm also a great eater. I'm really good at eating things. <laughs> so it, now for the listeners at home, what advice do you have for them either as a homeowner or of an aspiring entrepreneur? Yeah, I'd say homeowners like set up a schedule. If you're actually like really interested, especially if you're not in our service area, if you contact me on LinkedIn or, um, or contacts to our company, you want, we have a really nice checklist. It looks like a report card for your home on how to maintain things. We will give that to you. Like we want people to be able to maintain their homes. For entrepreneurs, I, I highly recommend that. Um, I'll say that you're, you're not as crazy as you think you are. Uh, there's other people out there that are also entrepreneurs and spend time with them. Get into a mastermind group or a networking group, spend time with others that you want to be like, because you, you over time become like the people that you're spending time with and, and be held accountable, hold others accountable, um, help be mentored, be a mentor, you know, and, uh, and, and just keep on going, have people hold you accountable and make sure that your Christmas card this year is impressive. There's still time. It's uh, not too late. Go out there and achieve your goals. I like it, man. You're getting me amped up. I'm going to go write a Christmas card now. I'm like going to start setting some 90 day, 30 day, 90 day goals. Now for the listeners at home, how do they find your business? Tell them the website, tell them the LinkedIn page. How can they find you? Yeah. Curahome.com is K-U-R-A-H-O-M-E. We're all over social media. We try to give a ton of helpful tips on there. So follow us on there. Um, I like to think of us as like Dr. Pimple Popper. You'll see like <laughs> animals coming out of drains and, and out of air ducts. So make sure you follow us on whatever social media you're on. If you want to connect with me personally, add me on LinkedIn, uh, Daniel Felt, that's F-E-L-T. And I, I love connecting with people all over the country. Daniel, thank you so much for your time. This was very 
one, I'm all amped up. I'm telling you that 30 day 90 play. I'm about to start making something up. Going to definitely check out the dryer vent now that you <laughs> reminded yeah. me. Probably going to get some coils for the refrigerator. Man, I got all sorts of things. Man, Daniel, thank you so much. This has been a very, very great uh, interview. I hope everything, I know you're expecting soon. So uh, congratulations. Yeah. I hope everything goes well. And I hope the chickens are good at the home. I, I hope my wife doesn't listen to this episode because she wants chicken so bad. I'm, I'm like, we are in the city. The neighbors do not want to hear a chicken in the morning every day. So, Daniel, That's thank awesome. you again so much. I will certainly connect with you on LinkedIn. And for those folks at home, please connect with me. Uh, please visit theshadesofe.com. You can also follow us on the Shades of E on all the social channels. Um, please subscribe to the newsletter. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.